Certain crimes possess a readily identifiable motive, such as seeking revenge or pursuing financial, sexual, or opportunistic gains. However, occasionally, a crime emerges that is exceedingly eerie, something devoid of any logical explanation or purpose. In these perplexing cases, devoid of any discernible logic, the chilling nature of the crime becomes all more pronounced, amplifying the difficulty of unraveling its enigma and bringing the perpetrators to justice. In some cases, hard-working detectives can clear the smoke and put the pieces of the puzzle together. Sometimes, though, the truth remains shrouded in mystery. In the summer of 1942, the world was in the midst of the Second Great War, and, as a result of that, pretty much everyone was being asked to help out with the fight. This didn't necessarily mean being on the front lines. No, in small-town Pascagoula, Mississippi, their role in the war was to help build warships, a job well-suited to the area due to the coastal location. With the growing industry came a growth in population, that meant the once sleepy locale had tripled in numbers by the time the early 40s came around. It also meant that local law enforcement wasn't used to dealing with so many people and, as a result, they quickly found themselves being spread too thin. Such an environment created the perfect atmosphere for crime to rise. In fact, during the summer of 1942 alone, the police regularly found themselves struggling to deal with a wave of drunken brawls, break-ins, and other petty thievery. These acts were made even easier for criminals to get away with because of the blackout regulations which had recently been put in place by the military. The regulations saw locals be forced to turn out their lights at night in order to make it difficult for potential enemy bombers to know where to strike. For as bad as that was, none of these trivial incidents compared to the strangest situation of all. A situation which first came to the public's attention on June 5th of that year. Basically, it was on that evening that Mary Evelyn Briggs and Edna Marie Heidel, two young girls living at the Our Lady of Victory's convent in town, awoke abruptly to the sight of a man looming over them with something shiny in his hand. Of course, once she saw that, Mary immediately yelled out in panic, causing the mystery figure to turn and flee as he made his escape through the bedroom window. But what had he been in their room for in the first place? Well, soon that became apparent as, while both girls were unharmed, they eventually realized locks of their hair were missing. It turned out that the shiny object the unseen assailant had been carrying was a pair of scissors. Scissors he'd used to give them an impromptu haircut. And if that wasn't creepy enough, it appeared this was his sole reason for breaking in that night. Upon inspection of the bedroom, nothing else was found to have been stolen. The only physical evidence that anyone had been there at all was the hole that was cut in the window screen. Obviously, once the two girls reported what had happened to their caregivers, it caused a panic and led to the police being called. Unfortunately for them, though, there was very little solid information the girls could give as to who their hair thief had been, as it was dark and the only description they had was that he was a short, fat man who was wearing a white sweatshirt. With very little to go on, law enforcement decided the best thing to do was bring in bloodhounds in the hopes that they'd be able to catch the scent this mystery figure had left behind following his escape. But even that turned out to be fruitless because, once the dogs reached the end of the nearby woods, they lost the scent. All that could be done at that point was hope that it was a one-time incident and that, given the kids hadn't actually been harmed, the person responsible wouldn't be a risk in the future. Those hopes would ultimately be proven false when, a few days later on Monday, June 8th, another break-in occurred, this time at the Petey family household. It was there that, while six-year-old Carol Petey slept next to her twin brother David in their bedroom, someone entered and stole a lock of her hair too. 
Of course, this meant the situation was going to be a reoccurring one, and that it was now imperative the police figure out the identity of the Phantom Barber before he struck again. But that wasn't the only issue they had to deal with at that point though, because, while they were trying their best to solve the mystery of who was responsible, a public panic was beginning to bubble up as well, making their lives all the more difficult. News of the break-ins had become common knowledge in Pascagoula and, because of that, people were growing increasingly concerned about their safety. Why would someone do such a thing, especially to little girls? Was it a fetish, or was it something altogether more concerning? These were just some of the questions that were being discussed around town. That led to increased home security becoming the norm for a while. Things got so bad, in fact, many locals even began boarding up their windows in order to make sure no one was going to sneak into their home at night and cut off anyone's hair. These weren't the only safety measures that were being carried out, though. No, on top of that, women were banned from going outside at night, a decision that was deemed necessary given the fact the mystery man appeared to be targeting females exclusively. Of course, none of that helped catch the assailant, though. No, that would require further knowledge of who they were and why they were doing what they were doing. So, in hopes of gaining that information, police began offering a $300 reward to anyone who could provide them with a solid lead about the Phantom Barber. Even with such a large amount of money on the table, especially for the time period, no one came forward. No one had any idea who the unidentified figure was. The only thing anyone knew for sure was that, outside of the vague description given to the authorities by Mary Evelyn Briggs and Edna Marie Heidel suggesting he was a short male, the thief had also unintentionally left behind a single sandy footprint on Carol Peedy's bed prior to fleeing the scene of the second break-in. But even that didn't bring police any closer to capturing their man before the next break-in could occur. On Friday, June 12th, the twisted assailant struck again, this time in a far darker fashion, when he broke into the home of Mr. and Mrs. Terrell Heidelberg and proceeded to attack them with an iron bar. Thankfully, though, neither were critically hurt during the attack. Both were left with a variety of injuries as Terrell was knocked unconscious during the scuffle and his wife had her front teeth knocked out. One interesting point the investigators on the scene took care to note, however, was that not a single hair was taken from Mrs. Heidelberg's head, leading them to wonder if this was indeed the work of the same assailant. Sure, this inconsistency could be explained away by the fact that Mrs. Heidelberg was an older woman and, as such, someone who wouldn't have fit with the Phantom Barber's apparent M.O. Maybe, the investigators thought, the attacker had fully intended to take a lock of hair and that it was only upon entering the house that he realized there was no young girls inside. Still, if he lived in the area, he must have known the Heidelbergs didn't have any children before he broke in. He must have also known the same was the case for Mrs. R.E. Taylor, the fourth and final victim. Someone who, a few days after the Heidelberg incident, was awoken from her slumber in the middle of the night by a smell that she later described as sickening. What was this smell? Chloroform. That's right, the mystery man had cut through her window screen and was trying to knock her out with a chloroform-soaked rag. I mean, he wasn't just trying. No, he ultimately succeeded, and once Mrs. Taylor was out cold, he brought out his scissors and stole away a lock of her hair as a memento. After news of the last two attacks got out to the public, it created a full-blown sense of mania as people were now no longer concerned for the hair of their children. They were also concerned for their own well-being. There was even a decree made by male factory workers that stated they would no longer be working night shifts until the culprit was caught as they didn't want to leave their wives and children home alone in the evening. Needless to say then, this was a major issue for those factories as it had a direct impact on the production of material for the war effort. With their owners placing additional pressure on the police to solve the case, it left them desperately trying to tie all the loose threads together as quickly as possible. Was it the work of one man, or was it multiple crimes that just appeared to be that way? These were the questions that needed answers urgently, but when it came to what those answers were, no one seemed to be able to agree on anything. After all, while each incident featured someone cutting a hole in a window screen in order to gain access to the household, only three had actually involved cutting off a woman's hair, and only two of those incidents had actually centered around a child's hair being removed. 
Really, then, it was entirely possible the third and fourth break-ins were the result of a separate assailant, with the fourth perhaps even being the work of a copycat. There were others who still insisted it was all one man, a man who had used the blackout regulations put in place by the military to do his dirty work under the cover of darkness. But if that was indeed the case, what were his true reasonings for doing so? While speculation had already begun running rife about possible sexual motives, another possible explanation which hadn't really been explored until then was the idea that this man may have been involved in the human hair trade. Yes, there's actually a long and storied history of human hair being used for a variety of different purposes, such as strengthening mud walls, soaking up oil spills, and even repelling snails in vegetable gardens. So with that in mind, it should come as no surprise that, during the 1800s, it wasn't uncommon for peasant girls to find themselves being shorn like sheep by wealthy traders, then having their hair be sold on for a tidy profit. Could this have been the reason the phantom barber was sneaking into homes at night and stealing women's hair? Was it actually related to some underground system of trade? Sure, it was 1942 by that point, but it didn't mean such practices were entirely extinct. If there was money to be made in something, then there were always going to be people willing to do it. Of course, that wasn't the only possible explanation being posited. No, the police were so desperate, they were even willing to listen to theories that were far more occult in their nature. Things such as hair, nail clippings, and teeth have often been considered to have religious or magical significance. In some parts of the world, it's common practice to burn hair in order to ensure others don't later use it for devious means. This theory was definitely a long shot, but the authorities were open to anything now. If it was some kind of illegal trade or occult-themed crime, it didn't explain the seeming escalation of violence in the break-ins. If the Phantom Barber only wanted hair, then why attack someone with an iron bar? No, the logical reason for such an act, at least as far as some of the detectives on the case were concerned, was that the crimes were the work of someone who was slowly building up towards carrying out something far more severe. It's actually not that uncommon for a killer to start off small and then gradually work their way up to more and more brutal crimes. If that was what was happening, it only increased the urgency to catch the culprit. If he wasn't caught soon, who knew what kind of scene was going to be discovered by police next time around? And that's exactly why Miris Talley, from the private detective organization the Pinkerton Agency, was brought in to try and shed some light on what was really happening. Of course, it was just as well he was, because with his help, two months later, a suspect would finally be arrested in the form of 57-year-old German-educated chemist William Dolan. Why was he considered to be the real phantom barber by investigators? Well, according to Miris, a number of witnesses claimed to have seen William in the area of the Heidelberg's home at the time of their assault. One person even went on record as saying that he had asked for a ride to a place not far from their house, and that an hour later he had returned to their truck saying some trouble had occurred there. But that wasn't all, because another witness claimed to have seen the chemist leaving the scene of the attack that night as well. And as if that wasn't enough, once his house was searched, a couple of pairs of barber's scissors were uncovered along with a bundle of hair, with some of that hair being believed to belong to Carol Petey herself. Obviously, then, it was looking pretty serious, and it only got worse for William the more the authorities dug into his past because it soon came to light that, after returning stateside once he'd obtained his degree in chemistry, he'd settled in New Orleans for a while, a place where he'd also been accused of several crimes. Even after he left Louisiana, problems seemed to come his way wherever he went. According to Miris, William had what he described as a coast-to-coast -coast record of charges prior to ever setting foot in Mississippi. Clearly, this was a man who was no stranger to criminal activity. That said, none of that explained why he would choose to carry out such a peculiar crime. Luckily, though, the investigation team soon reached another breakthrough, at least when it came to a motive for going after Terrell Heidelberg. It eventually came to light that William had been holding a grudge against Terrell's father for some time. Why was that? Well, the Heidelberg Patriarch was a local magistrate who had apparently refused to lower William's bail in regards to an unrelated trespassing charge several months before. Once he realized that the police were aware of that fact, William realized he'd been caught, freely admitting his role in the attack. He would continue to maintain his innocence when it came to the other three break-ins, though. 
According to him, he wasn't the Phantom Barber, and he never had been, a claim which seemed suspect to many given the hair that was found in his home. So it should go without saying, then, that few people in Pascagoula believed him when he said that, especially after it came out that he'd spent a significant portion of time in Germany studying prior to living in Mississippi. Given this was still the middle of World War II, any potential association with the enemy was seen as a glaring red flag to say the least. That led to much speculation that William Dolan was actually a German agent, one whose midnight haircuts had been carried out in order to terrorize the town and try to lower morale for the war effort. After all, with all the manufacturing that was going on in Pascagoula, it would make sense for it to be a Nazi target. And with William already having admitted to his role in at least one of the break-ins, it all just seemed to fit perfectly. Still, William would continue to maintain his innocence anyway, at least when it came to cutting off women's hair. That combined with the fact the crucial footprint found in Carol Petey's room was deemed to have not belonged to him meant he wouldn't actually be convicted of those crimes. William Dolan had already admitted to attacking the Heidelbergs in their bedroom, so that was why, after a brief period of deliberation following his trial, he was found guilty and sentenced to 10 years in prison by the presiding judge on charges of molestation and attempted murder. But did that mean that, despite his protest, the case of the Phantom Barber was then officially closed? According to the locals, yes it did. As far as they saw it, in fact, no matter what William claimed, he was clearly the culprit. An argument that was backed up by the fact that once he was safely behind bars, the incident stopped entirely. Of course, if he was indeed the man cutting off women's hair in the summer of 1942, it remains unclear to this day as to why he would do such a thing at all, and the lack of a real motive eventually led to Mississippi State Governor Fielding Wright deciding to have William Dolan take a polygraph test in order to find out if he really was telling the truth. Now, it should be noted that while polygraphs are inadmissible in court today on account of their lack of reliability, back in 1948, they were considered accurate, and so, when William passed his test, he was released from prison early on a limited suspension. Not that he was going to be able to stay in Pascagoula for long, though. With the populace still widely believing him to be the phantom barber who would terrorize them so much during 1942, there wasn't a lot of love and understanding to be found for William. That was why, once he was free to leave town, he packed up his things and took his family to nearby Waveland instead. But even that wouldn't be the end of the story because there was still one more twist left to come. After settling into his new home, William Dolan would go missing one day, only for his body to later be found floating in the Mississippi River near Shelmet, Louisiana. Had he taken his own life? That's certainly what his wife believed when she identified his corpse. Of course, that may not be true, though. In a curious final fact prior to his body being buried in the Cedar Rest Cemetery in Bay St. Louis, fingerprints were taken from the corpse. Prints which were later checked out by the FBI and didn't actually match those of the supposedly dead man. So had he faked his own death? It appears so, especially as prior to disappearing, the purported phantom barber had purchased a life insurance policy and left it with his wife. Sadly for her, though, that policy would ultimately be made void by the insurance company when, a few years later, a vagrant was arrested in Sacramento who appeared to match a description of William. But whether he was still alive or not wasn't really the important question. No, the important question was, had he been the man who had broken into a number of people's homes in Pascagoula back in the summer of 1942 and stole locks of hair? And if he was that man, then why? Of course, the sad reality is we might never get a true answer to either of those questions at this point. While you could argue that the fact the haircut stopped once William Dolan was arrested seems damning, that in itself isn't proof. And no matter how sure the locals may have been that they'd caught the right man, the mystery of the Phantom Barber will always remain just that. A mystery. Thanks for letting us tell you this sinister story. If you enjoyed it, subscribe on whatever platform you're on, and hit like, rate it, or leave a comment. Join us next week when we'll take you somewhere sinister.